What's up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest number 192 on Thursday, month, 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 September, that's that, that word, 26, that block height, 596,704. What's going on today, Rick? Oh, nothing much, you know, just watching this, keeping my eye on this price. It's pretty crazy the way things have been bubbling up lately and right when we start we start crashing again this is uh yeah but outside of that man it's uh it's been pretty good i'm doing good how about yourself janine how are you doing today um i mean i was just laughing to myself because apparently there's a twitter account that keeps track of petitions to the uk parliament that are rejected and the one that came up today was about how someone tried to petition petition for jazz hands to be added um, as a response in order to accommodate PTSD sufferers in Parliament, which is pretty cool. <laughs> what? What? What the fuck? So wait a minute, you like, you, jazz hands helps PTSD, huh? <laughs> yeah, because apparently, well, this is the confusing part. I mean, I don't know if you, anyone who's ever watched UK Parliament sessions, you can tell that they're always yelling at each other. So, uh, I guess, well, they were saying they wanted to replace clapping, but actually there is no clapping. Well, there is clapping, but it's not really a formal way of responding. But apparently they wanted to replace something with jazz hands, which is funny. <laughs> Pretty sure that like every uh, person I know who served in the military, I uh, would find that pretty fucking offensive. Yeah, um, not surprising. And but also, I expect there to be some kind of parody of UK Parliament members yelling at each other and doing jazz hands. Oh my lord! At this point, man, I mean that's just like yeah. I don't know. I guess it's par for the course. I'll Whatever. I would just start laughing a little bit because it is kind of just like you kind of have to figure out how to get through all that stuff by yourself. But yeah, that sounds ridiculous. How are you doing today, Nopara? I'm pretty good. I just experienced after three to five years of coding in cafes, cafeterias, <laughs> that to how to work in an office again. And I kind of like it. Yeah. Uh, Ew. Ew. Traitor. Ah, <laughs> oh, man, there's nothing wrong with an office space. I might be fortunate enough to get one one day. Yeah, this just became a job. Ah, well, I hope you got a good view. <laughs> All right, man. Well, yeah, it's been kind of crazy. I mean, like, I just almost don't even want to look at a price tab right now because it seems like we're going all over the place. But uh, what's been going on with the news lately, Shinobi? Like, uh, where are we starting out today? It doesn't matter. None of it matters. Nothing matters. <laughs> yeah, you say that, and then, you know, some people might take that seriously. It does matter. Uh, are you saying that Zap doesn't matter? I think he's yelling about the price. Nothing <laughs> really matters to me. All right, all right, you guys, you guys suck. Uh, uh, you're all kicked off the show because Queen is the shit. Um, Man, this show is so, never going to so exist. Guess, you're uh, just I, kicking I'm everybody off the show the past few weeks. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take over the show. Today. All right, why don't you tell us what's going on? Yeah, so, um, you know, first up is uh, Jack Mahler's announcement of this Olympus service uh, on Zap. And 
And, you know, I kind of want to start off with a caveat here. Um, this, this uses the turbo channel concept from bit refill. And, you know, I've said in the past, I don't really like that service, but the entire design of it uh, shuttles the risk onto a person completely willing to take it. And if somebody wants to take a risk, uh, that's, that's up to them. But that out of the way, um, you know, Jack has obviously been thinking a lot about really the whole package of getting you into Bitcoin, into the Lightning Network and actually using it and having a holistic solution to that the whole way through. And one of the biggest problems is, you know, onboarding into the Lightning Network. I mean, it's a fucking pain in the ass. Like even as somebody who's been in this space for, you know, more than half of its existence, like it's a pain in the ass, it's annoying. I have to take Bitcoin or acquire it if I don't have it, move it from one wallet into another wallet, then make another transaction in that new wallet and wait for it to link. And then finally, I can buy something with Lightning Network. Well, Jack is setting things up so that you can just punch in your credit or your debit card, hit a button, and instantaneously have a turbo channel set up in your zap wallet that can make payments at the snap of a finger. So pretty much completely go from zero Bitcoin, zero channels to spending on the Lightning Network snap. And there's two important things I think to really, you know, go, go into to show just where Jack's head at and why personally I agree with like what he's doing. Uh, the first is like this is being architected and integrated into Zap Wallet in a very isolated firewalled way. So this has been designed from scratch so that going forward, Zap can be compiled or released into versions that have this Olympus uh, service plugin and don't have it. So that using Zap, you know, if you're not going to use this this new way to get Bitcoin you don't even have to have that software included in the wallet. It's completely partitioned. And if you want to completely keep even the code for that out of the wallet you're using, Jack's designing to enable that from day one. And the second thing is that this service is not something that's being tightly baked into Zap. This is being designed in a way so that any other Lightning wallet out there can, you know, plug into and integrate with and use the Olympus service for people to just go from zero Bitcoin, zero channels to active and spending money on the Lightning network in a snap. And so like this is really, you know, a well thought through way to handle this kind of integration into this wallet. Yeah, man. I mean, this was something that I was just like, as soon as I saw the tweet come out from Jack about how quick it went, you could just see him go through the process, immediately retweeted and just could hardly believe that how fast it was. And yeah, I mean, you know, we had heard about this or I had heard about this months ago and it was something that was just being worked on in the background and to see it finally come out and just work so smoothly and quickly just onboarded into the Lightning Network and being able to spend those Bitcoins, that's really important. I mean, whenever you look at uh, his parents' business and, you know, here locally with the cannabis industry, it's really hard to get people onboarded into Bitcoin and a possibility of some way for them to spend Bitcoin for cannabis is really difficult. It's something where we you'd have to tell somebody to go to an exchange or, you know, download another wallet and this wallet or go to that ATM and then come back to us. Where now it could be a simple process of, hey, you know, here, here's the Zap wallet, download that, go in there, you can connect your bank account, you know, very minimal KYC, which was really exciting to see that, you know, that they could do that. And just to see that, you know, that this thing can be a real possibility for people walking around in Colorado or, or any store, really, where somebody wants to get more Bitcoin adoption and get more people spending. They have this easy one step process of, you know, well, one step you download just the Zap wallet. You don't have to go download this wallet or that wallet and give people a myriad of options where, you know, they can download this wallet. 
They can buy some Bitcoins on Lightning Network and get it funded through these turbo channels and immediately go to spend that. And you could get some sort of discount program that the merchant allows for using, you know, this payment method. So it's really awesome to see. And like you're saying, the minimal KYC was just, you know, it's great to see that it's the way it is. I know people are upset whenever you say KYC, but to have that lower level of it was uh, really great to see. And yeah, I'm just really excited for Jack and Zap and the future with Lightning Network because it is one of those things where when we're looking at the development of the Lightning Network and the way, you know, it's done in a way that is uh, slow and organic. And, you know, a lot of that is, uh, you know, slowly bringing people in where this can give people the option to get in the Lightning Network a lot faster. And uh, yeah, it's awesome. That's the real interesting part, though, is like I was mostly concerned with just like what Olympus means for like lightning in general. But Jack, you know, from a personal point of view, like his whole goal from day one has been get this working and seamless so that people can spend Bitcoin at the dispensary and it not have a huge friction involved in getting people onto it. And it's like I think this is pretty much there at this point. Yeah, man, it'll be exciting to actually, uh, hopefully we can have him on. We have him scheduled for a special edition and we can bring him on and get more into detail about everything going on with uh, with the Zap wallet and how exactly, you know, Olympus was all put together and just get more details on uh, how exactly it's going to be used and should be a great discussion. I'm really looking forward to that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely going to be fun. Well, now that we're at the topic, I know there's something I'm forgetting, I'm leaving out, but it is just a great development, you know, just to have somebody be able to easily onboard like that. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. All right, so I guess, uh, who's up next? Actually, it's you, man, again, we're talking about the hash rate. What? What? You can't make me talk twice in a row. What's this bullshit? This isn't fair. Well, you wanted control of the show. You got to talk twice in a row. Never! Okay, okay. So, um, yeah, pretty much uh, th there's, you know, all this, this nonsense floating around in the, the whole ecosystem right now looking at you know, just the this supposed huge drop in, in the hash rate that, that was shortly, if I'm getting my cause and effect right before the, the recent price drop. And everybody was screaming about this, but it's, it's just a completely illogical reactionary thing. Like we do not actually have a way to measure hash rates we are pretty much just guess like all we do is look back at the let's say the, the last difficulty period and just average out blocks you know how fast they're coming in and guess and the thing about guessing statistically like that is the shorter of a time span you look at the less accurate that guess is going to be and just because of how proof of work you know functions like we could literally right now have just one block for the rest of the day without any miners unplugging without any change in the actual hash rate operating on this planet we could wind up only having a single block for the rest of the day because that just happens that's how mining works when you're mining your probability of finding the next block is the same. That probability doesn't change. And the actual time interval between blocks that are really found is, is random. Like it, it could be, we could get 10 blocks in the next 30 seconds. We could get just a single block for the whole rest of the day. And if you try to look at that very tiny span of time and make a guess at how much hash rate is actually operating on the or on this planet right now, it's going to be completely off 
because that time span is too short for those averages to actually work out to an approximation of reality. And so like this, this pretty much is just complete and utter FUD being spun around by people who do not understand how mining works, how proof of work works, and how the metrics around those things are constructed and gathered in the first place. Um, I can't hear you, Nofara. Oh man, it sounds like your mic got unplugged or something because it's just completely blank. But yeah, man, like, I mean, I'll just go into the fact that, you know, we've been covering mining for a while now and how much these new companies are bringing, they've been bringing these new miners online, new farms online with these new miners. We've seen the hash rate double over this year and things have gotten really high to where. You know, I mean, it's not too out of the ordinary, I would think, for one of these large mining farms to kind of do a reboot process or something to where a lot of machines get shut off at once and then they come back online because it was a large dip in the hash rate. But, I mean, it recovered and I don't, you know, I mean, it's the hash rate keeps growing and it's growing and growing. I don't see it really just starting to tear down. I mean, uh, if the price starts to fall, we'll see the hash rate fall a little bit more, but... You know, that's not, I don't know, that's not really to do with uh, the market forces of developing the mining industry as more as just like the market forces it takes to stay operating in the mining industry. Yeah, and, and like I said, you know, it's not, you don't even have to like have some miner reset a farm or anything. Like that could have literally happened with nothing anywhere being turned off. Like that's just how mining works. It's it's a it's a random probability. All right, no problem. All right, no. Yeah, you want to give us microphone this check? check. It worked. Okay, so I had to turn it off and turn it on again. I love how that always works. <laughs> just, <Yeah. laughs> just like those miners, right? Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go on. No, we were no, just. Uh... Were, were you trying to say something earlier? Yeah, but it doesn't make sense anymore. You were talking about that it only confuses people who doesn't understand how to how to interpret their results of what's going on and how they are measured in the mining. And I just said, oh, the, so people like me. But it's not funny <laughs> if I explain. Oh man, it's... joke ruined by malfunctioning mic. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, actually, we we noticed it too. I, I, and honestly, I I didn't hear about this until just now from you. But yeah, we noticed it too. It's uh, transactions were confirming very, very fast today, and that was that was really strange. But thanks for the explanation. Alrighty, so I guess. Uh, I yes. Know, do you want to get in the argument? Because uh, we we got to get in the argument eventually. I I'm happy to go in an argument. I'm not sure what where do we have the argument, but well, I I start talking and then we'll see. So Google has reported that they reached quantum supremacy with a 54 qubit uh, machine. It's somewhat debated if they really reached it or not. I don't know. At the very least, uh, they are very close to it. Uh, one interesting thing about this is that in the beginning of this year, in January, they came up with a 72 qubit supercomputing chip named Bristol, Bristol Cone. Uh, but they did not reach quantum supremacy with this machine. They actually reached quantum supremacy with a 54 qubit chip. Uh, code name Sycamore. So yeah, and and this outperforms their seventy-two qubit machines. 
So in interesting things now. What what is quantum supremacy and does it really matter? Quantum supremacy simply means that uh, in one specific very useless task, a quantum computer is able to outperform the best uh, classical supercomputer in the world. Uh, why does it matter? Because uh, from there on, if someone reaches quantum supremacy, presumably now Google did, uh, then we have practical uh, empirical evidence that, okay, now quantum computing is not a fad. It's actually going to be useful for some things. Um, this is this is what quantum supremacy is now how does it immediately affect bitcoin <laughs> not at all i mean it just it just it, it, it's nothing we are still very very far from quantum computers are doing actually anything useful uh but what i think um what makes sense to go into actually shinobi do, do you have anything to add to it uh, so far yeah, I mean, I think, like, first of all, I want to clarify um, where my source on this is. Um, it is Isis Lovecraft. And the only reason I am giving her any kind of credit here is because she actually is, um, like, her academic training is as a physicist. But pretty much what what's actually going on here is um, two things that just make this complete fake news. Um, one is, um, out of those 54 actual physical qubits, they don't have that many logical qubits. So like the, the basic idea is that, you know, a qubit can be a zero and a one simultaneously, and you make an array of them quantumly entangled, and then you can observe a single one and collapse it into a definitive state. And the entanglement causes all of them to collapse and you can that's how you pretty much get through like a, a search space faster because instead of having to go through it linearly you just can sample things in a well-constructed circuit and get through the space faster but they don't actually have 54 logical qubits because a lot of the uh, the physical qubits are to make the logical qubits redundant. So for like every logical qubit they can do a computation with, they have multiple physical qubits um, functioning as that to deal with the quantum decoherence. So like the entanglement falling apart and the whole thing breaking. So like they're completely misrepresenting like where they're at in that way. And then also, what they actually did was pretty much use the quantum chip to generate a random number and then used a conventional computer to break that random number and prove it's not really random because of interference at a quantum level. So pretty much the computation they ran, in addition to like the qubits um, thing being misrepresented, actually proves that this doesn't work because it proves the random number failed at being random because of interference at a physical level. Okay. And what do you think about, are we close to quantum supremacy or not? Um, based on this, um, no, nowhere near it, but you know, I mean, that's kind of the, uh, the Bitcoiners dilemma when it comes to things like this, uh, what else is going on in secret that we're not hearing constant announcements like this to, to be able to pick apart, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not quite sure that there are any more secrets, uh, in the world in terms of scientific improvement, uh, maybe, maybe weaponizing stuff, but, but uh, I, I don't the know, NSA, it's not really happening that much anymore. I guarantee you the NSA has a department working on, on quantum computing. 
yeah, and I guarantee you that they are nowhere near anything where Google or Microsoft is doing. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, maybe <laughs> we don't, don't know. Yeah, we don't know. It's a, it's a argument that makes no sense to argue on because there is just not enough information to base upon anything. Anyway, uh, what I thought would be interesting to go into how if quantum computer would break the discrete, discrete logarithm assumption, then how that would affect Bitcoin. Um, and I, my guess is the very first thing that would be broken is the pay to pop key coins. Now there are 1 million Bitcoins on these pay to pop key coins. Right now we are sending to each other's to Bitcoin addresses and those Bitcoin addresses actually coming from public key hashes. So that's the difference there. There is a hashing on the public keys, but in the early days, people were spending to each other pay to pop key. And those are what are the most risks to be stolen first. Um, and then there are some things like RBF transactions. Uh, for example, in an RBF transaction, it, if you if you broadcast a transaction, then you actually expose your, your public key. And now with the RBF transaction, they have uh, about that much time as as long as it confirms to to actually break uh, your public key, get your private key back from it. Uh, and with RBF, uh, they can change the outputs to to their outputs. Now, this can be also done with normal Bitcoin transactions after you broadcast, uh, but then you also would have to be a miner and not only a miner, but the miner who actually mines that transaction that you are targeting. So that's the, that's the idea there, but uh, I don't think we will get even that far to, to they be able to mess with RBFs because it just the pay to pop key, they case, they just have we so much more time to, to actually break at least one pay to pop key. And we noticed before there is that, I don't know, two day window for RBF transactions. Uh, that's, that might be the bottleneck there. Uh, so, so that's, that's my, that's my guess. What would happen? Uh, I'm pretty confident the common, the Bitcoin community and the developers would handle this very well. There are also, there are already proposals about uh, moving to quantum safe cryptography. Uh, I'm pretty unconfident that the pay to pop key uh, Bitcoins would be, would be saved. They are probably going to be hacked because the only way to, to save them is to hard for them out, which, which is probably no one would, not many people would go into and then 1 million Bitcoin will be dumped on the market or something like that. I don't know. So, so yeah, uh, that's, that might be the only thing that, that, that could be worrisome in the, I don't know, 10 years down the line or 20. Yeah. Who knows? I'm like, not even really worried about this as an issue at this point anymore. I mean, you know, there, there's Tim Ruffing's blinded migration idea, but, um, you know, Adam Back's idea where you could have a zero knowledge proof that shows that you control a, a related key in an HD wallet without revealing it and then just require, um, you know, fork and require that proof in order to spend coins from now on. And, you know, I, I, st I, st I still need to, like, uh, poke him and put this idea in his head but like maybe it would even be possible to like introduce like for any keys that are not in an hd wallet like introduce some new entropy to make a derived key from that and then do the zero knowledge proof with that 
you know, and if something like that would be possible, then literally every key would be safe like after that fork like even pay to public keys would would be safe if you could like find a way to derive a new key to make that proof with non-hd wallets okay that's that's interesting uh i i didn't hear about that before i thought all the the ideas were about uh to to make Bitcoin quantum safe. That's why I was never worried about uh, Bitcoin uh, itself. I was kind of only worried about my personal wealth because of that uh, of that one million pay to pop key coins. Actually, <laughs> that gets um, I take that back. I take that back. Um, it would not work with pay to public key because anyone could derive the uh, private key okay. to make a proof, but it, it would work with any um like non-raw public key like non-hd wallets you know what i mean like an open dime or like a core a wallet that after they started using public key hashes yeah you know even t actually the only proposal i know is tamos's proposal to invalidate uh, these these coins but that tamos is a air bitcoin moderator moderator the owner and they he has some some never things with bitcoin.org uh, i don't think he's the owner he's just a moderator maybe what whatever so his proposal was to invalidate the satoshi coins but that thing came in the worst possible time when everyone was hating timos because of roger Ver's propaganda was pretty successful back then so it seemed to me that the the idea has been just uh, swept under the rug for for good and maybe we won't even be able to to take it out anymore it's never because, happened yes like the, we are never going to fork to invalidate valid coins that's that's never happened yeah i mean yeah i Bye. maybe i i mean when it when it gets closer that Okay, what will happen first? Not one million Bitcoin will be dumped in the market, but at first it's going to be only a thousand. Um, maybe we don't even notice that then 10,000. Oh, maybe we notice that one and we start to think about that. And a hundred thousand. Oh, fuck. That's not good. Uh, See, like, maybe no people problem. reconsider it. By the time this is an issue, like there's not gonna be dumping like it's just they're gonna just keep those bitcoin and spend them yeah i hope so all right i have nothing more to say about this all right so uh rick you're up yeah all right let's leave the world of you know, all what's going on in the world of quantum supremacy and get back into what's going on with all this price stuff or, you know, contracts. Let's talk about this back launch. All right. We don't normally talk price, but when there are major when there are major new players stepping into the space, like the Intercontinental Exchange is backed contracts. And with all the meta game theory surrounding their entry, it's a deserving time to put that under the microscope. Now we'll get back to that now. We've been talking about these physically delivered futures and their potential launch since they were first introduced in the middle of last year. For the uninitiated, they are physically delivered daily and monthly contracts where you can receive the underlying if you'd like, meaning you can actually hold the Bitcoin. Then at the same time, BACT has their own custodial warehouse for their customers' Bitcoin if they elect for BACT to custody them. There was a great high quality meme put out the day of the launch where you could see John Travolta's famous looking around the room from Pulp Fiction while he's in a very empty backed warehouse. Some people thought the launch would bring a fury of new investors into Bitcoin, but its opening was a slow trickle. After the first 24 hours of trading, backed managed to trade 71 contracts, 166 contracts the second day, and a little over 200 yesterday. And we are already at around 100 contracts on this, the fourth day of their launch. The, that volume is definitely nowhere near the likes of BitMEX, Coinbase, or Kraken, but 
This low volume should have been expected when you look at the release of the CME and CBOE contracts a little over two years ago. They started off with a slow trickle and gradually evolved over time. The CBOE, <clears throat> excuse me, the CBOE dropped their product since most people were going to the CME and their total volume for this month, two plus years after launch, is just 2,165 Bitcoins. Now, when they launched, the price crashed and everyone wanted to blame the institutions. The reality was that had more to do with Gox funds moving around than the futures. Anyway, this go round, everyone was watching the price of Bitcoin hovering around 10,000 for months, slowly starting to deflate in price with a sell the news style event. That went down to around $9,600 before the bottom fell out and we saw a drop of nearly 15% to bounce around $8,000. Well, now we're down to like 7,700 and the moment of this recording. Now, this sell-off and the bottom falling out coincides with the final days of that wedge pattern we've been stuck in for months. So this bouncing around 8K and where we go from here is hard to say. We'll have to wait for wait some time to see if, what kind of structure builds out of this scenario. Either way, we now have another major institutional product for people who want to invest in Bitcoin. It might take a little time to build up that volume, but it wouldn't surprise me if we see a large spike at BACT and CME with the release of mainstream stories, like stories hitting the mainstream. And uh, also, they aren't stopping at just this release. They are still working with merchants like Starbucks to develop a payment solution for their product. Here are some quotes from the launch blog post at BACT. Quote, with the successful launch of U.S. regulated physically physical delivery Bitcoin futures for the first time, the details may matter less than the simple fact that such trading now exists. In working with customers and regulators to develop products that meet this, their standards for trading, investing, custody, and payments, there are a few fundamental truths we've heard regardless of the audience or the application. 1. Reliable and regulated infrastructure matters to investors and consumers alike. 2. Digital currency represents both new technology and new financial instruments and trust is central to the adoption of both. Three, innovative ways of managing and transferring digital value are expanding rapidly. So in this, uh, these are, this is still from the quote. These are concepts upon which we are building back. We are still with the basics, with, we are still with the basics, instilling trust through regulation and secure custody and deploying products that are transparent and regulated to support their adoption. Our team is excited to deliver on this mission and the early results are tangible today. With the launch of fully regulated infrastructure for Bitcoin now complete, we will continue to work to strengthen and deliver on the potential of this new asset class." Close quote. All right. Yeah, and with that, we have another major player on the Bitcoin stage and we have another sort of realization from the market of what kind of volume is there at these institutional levels. And I mean, they're certainly not what we would like to see as far as, you know, how the stock to flow model moves up so rapidly and everything. But that can happen whenever we start to see more talk about the happening coming up in less than eight months and people wanting to rush into the space. They do have this option afforded to them. So, uh, yeah. This is what's going on with the back launch right now. Did you guys have any comment on uh, the way it's been playing out? Wait, what? Price go down? Wall Street doesn't immediately become super majority of liquidity? What the fuck? I want my money back. <laughs> that seems to be what the general market sentiment was. And, you know, there's always like that market fervor for what it's going to be and then the reality of what it is. And yeah, I imagine that's a, what a lot to do with this uh, shakeout and, you know, this price drop and everything has to do with that. It, it, it just it, it blows my mind. Like literally every public figure in this entire ecosystem with a brain has been saying for months, like, you know, that this isn't just going to explode in volume day one this isn't gonna have an immediate effect on price and it, and, and people still like thought it would like you, you literally have all the people who know anything saying the exact opposite so why the fuck do crowds of people still believe shit like that in the face of, of, of situations like that it, it's mind-boggling 
Well, you know, I mean, I'll have to admit, it was one of those where I didn't even know what was going to happen. I mean, like, for sure, I knew the general market sentiment was everybody wanted the price to go down. Everybody wants to buy another dip before we start reaching these uh, levels that mod that follow the stock to flow model. And, you know, yeah, this is, I mean, like, you know, this is just what it is. And I mean, you know, I kind of expected like more in favor that it was going to go down than up. But there was a part of me, a small, a small percentage of me that was thinking, you know, yeah, you try to transpose the past onto the future and the market will surprise you. And I was thinking, well, yeah, we did sell off really hard with the sell the new style event for that one. But, you know, yeah, I was thinking, man, that's going to be like just the market plan with participants where they're going to look at that and they're going to think this and then it's going to happen another way. And, you know, yeah. Lost a little bit of money, but there's enough volatile movements right now. Anybody can, you know, carve out a dollar here and there. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, that's uh, that's about what's going on with BACT. Uh, we can move on into these other options now that are afforded to some traders. All right. So what? Is there something I missed? Options. Options. I like options. That means choices. Yeah, options are good. Brings competition, you know, just helps improve the market. So now we have options, or well, we will. So with the addition of these new futures contracts, we are also seeing the evolution of that first series of contracts. The CME put out a blog post just a few days ago, a few days before the back launch. Sorry. Yeah, they put out a blog post a few days before the back launch saying, they were going to be offering their customers options in the first quarter of 2020. This is from their post, quote, based on increasing client demand and robust growth in our Bitcoin futures market, we believe the launch of options will provide our clients with additional flexibility to trade and hedge their Bitcoin price risk. These new products are designed to help institutions and professional traders manage spot market Bitcoin exposure, as well as hedge Bitcoin futures positions in a regulated exchange environment, close quote. Which these options contracts, you know, they give traders the choice of whether or not to sell their futures contracts on or before the expiration date. And then the CMA, the CME gave us some interesting statistics since their release in, the, in this blog post saying, quote, since, their, since the CME launch, in December 2017, market users have rapidly adopted CME Bitcoin futures for their hedging and trading needs. There have been 20 successful futures expiration settlements and more than 3,300 individual accounts have traded the product since inception. Year to date, nearly 7,000 CME Bitcoin futures contracts, equivalent to about 35,000 Bitcoins, have traded on average each day." Close quote. So these contracts, they are evolving and, uh, you know, CME wants to bring these options to their traders. However, this is all given regulatory approval. That's the only exception to this whole story is that this is given regulatory approval by the SEC and CFTC that these options can be afforded to their customers. But we know the CME is close to regulators with them being the first to market with futures contracts. And then these options are being requested by their customers. It's not just an arbitrary addition. So it wouldn't be too surprising to me if we do see these options coming out in the first quarter of 2020. But I don't know. What do you guys think? Well, I mean, it's, you know, this is kind of the opposite end of back. You know, the CME has had their, their futures products for quite a while now, and they've built up over time. I mean, you know, 35,000 Bitcoin, I mean, that's still not hitting, you know, Bitfinex, Bitmax levels, so on. But it's that's a pretty impressive thing, given they've been around what two years now. Like that, that's pretty steady, solid growth. And that's, you know, that's how these these more mature regulated markets work. Like you, you, people don't just dive in to the newest ICO pump on a whim, like all at once. Like that, that's not how like the more mature markets function. And so it's, it's like, you know, you, you really need to step back and, and lengthen your time horizons there when, you, when you're forming expectations on things like this. And I think this, this is like the perfect opposite side of back. You know what I mean? Like, let's look at like uh, somebody who launched a 
similar product two years ago. They're launching more now because the demand has built up and it's there. Yeah, I mean, whenever the CBO, CBOE closed up shop, everybody was, kind of, oh, what about these futures contracts? And what happened is like, well, those, you know, they just weren't getting the volume that CME was. And it was obvious that the market had kind of decided where it was going to land on those futures contracts. And yeah, now we're seeing the CME actually grow those to include options. So yeah, that's a, uh, that's a positive sign as well as the whole backed release and the way that that's going. I know it's kind of below what the market expectations were, but like you're saying, I mean, pretty much everybody kind of understood the way it was going to play out. So it's uh, it's just a good thing to have these options available to traders and investors to, you know, make their move into the space and get exposure to Bitcoin to a way that they're comfortable. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you know, the rabbit hole pulls some chunk of everybody down <laughs> to actually accepting their own Bitcoin eventually. One day. And um, yeah, so I guess next up, I'm going to be going into the BIP draft for early, actually. Um, so we, we covered, uh, man, I'm so bad about this. Like Rick and Janine, like you guys can, can ping out like exact episode numbers most of the time but at, at some point in the past i have been here and ranted about early uh, when the white paper was released and the, the tldr is pretty much right now bitcoin transactions get around the network by me just going do you have this transaction and sending the full id and you going no and me sending that if you don't um that's really inefficient and so the, the gist of early is you can vaguely classify nodes as public, so accepting connections from other people, or private, um, the only connections they have are ones they make with other nodes. And the idea of early is that transaction relaying only works the old way now between the public nodes. And all of those private nodes instead, kind of every little bit, um, you use the kind of cryptography, uh, the, the math that um, things like uh, compact blocks use for set reconciliation to figure out the transactions um, each are missing from each other more efficiently. And so there's actually a draft BIP now um, to start working on changes to the peer-to-peer -peer protocol to actually support and so th this involves pretty much um, some new data structures and some new messages. Um, so first, um, there is now going to be a 32-bit short um, ID for unique transactions um, used in the set reconciliation. And these are going to be salted so that they're unique for every um, node you're connected to. Um, there's going to be a new data structure for actually having the sketches of transaction sets for people to figure out which ones they're missing between each other. And as well, they're going to have a transaction ID that gets cut down to 128 bits instead of the full 256 bits to save some space. And then as far as the actual um, protocol messages, um, they've created a uh, send reconciliation uh, message, a request reconciliation message to initiate the set reconciliation, a sketch message for um, sending the actual uh, reconciliation um, sketch for the sets, uh, a request uh, a bisective um, sketch, so pretty much request a new smaller um, sketch for set reconciliation because the first one didn't work a message for actually reconciling the differences between sets, and then a new message for um, requesting and getting transactions using the new shorter IDs. As well, um, it, it's going to require nodes to keep local states for the, the sets they have with each node they're connected to, they're reconciling, um, snapshots of those sets for each node they're connected to during reconciliation, and then a variable uh, Q coefficient. And pretty much that's just a variable to um, 
you know, like the, the more transactions that um, two nodes don't have from each other every time they reconcile, the higher that variable is and the less, um, the lower it'll be. And the idea is, you know, if you have a node where you guys are only missing a few transactions every time you reconcile, you don't have to reconcile as much. But if you're missing a lot, then you guys should be reconciling a lot to make sure everybody has everything. And so pretty much this is just kind of taking, you know, the whole protocol and the white paper and laying out um, changes in the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer protocol so that we can actually start moving towards implementing this in the long term. Okay, can I have a question? Is that, no. uh, are you saying that uh, now with this new protocol, nodes will actually have the full mempool or do I misunderstand something? Yes, yes. The, the, this is just for um, like, you, you know, like compact blocks, you have like the, the set sketch um, so that you don't have to actually relay most of what's in a block. Um, it, it's just applying that so that people can um, relay transactions more efficiently. So instead of like an invoice request for every single transaction, like every couple of seconds, nodes just reconcile their set sketches and then exchange the difference. So it's to, uh, to save bandwidth. I think though the savings was like uh, 40% um, based on their network simulation. Okay, uh, because when I was implementing Hidden Wallet back in the day, uh, I saw that there was a beep uh, that Jeff Garzik did that okay let's let's be able to ask for all the transactions from the node and i was using that and worked great on the testnet <laughs> but worked terribly on the mainnet because there were just so many transactions so that's actually a much more sophisticated uh, method and i'm looking forward to to see it and maybe implement it later Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, you know, it's, it's, you might find some benefit there, but mo mostly though, the, the, the rationale between or for early is that the bandwidth savings, either one, uh, lets people run a node who couldn't before because of bandwidth costs or two, um, it allows you to connect to more nodes using the same amount of bandwidth so that you are a lot safer from partition attacks. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, but by the way, just, just one more thing. Uh, I just want to say that uh, well, how, how the Bitcoin mempool actually works, it's, it's, it's not like uh, you send a transaction request that, hey, can you give me this transaction? It's you send inv, uh, transaction IDs to all the nodes that, hey, I have these transactions and they reply back to you with transaction IDs, hey, I need these transactions, and then the nodes give the transactions. So yeah, it's just uh, another round, uh, one more round, what you said. Okay, okay. But yeah, it's, you know, the, the just is like, it's a huge uh, bandwidth savings. So that's either like a, a, a cost savings or a security improvement, depending on how you want to spend that, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. All right, and then I guess next up is uh, not not much to it, but uh, 0.18.1 of Elements has been released. Um, and these features are not in Liquid yet, although they should be following soon. But uh, the new version of Elements uh, catches uh, the code base up with Bitcoin Core 0.18.1, so pretty much everything in the release notes for that version of Core applies. But also the element specific things is um, there's now PSBT support for confidential transactions, um, so that's a really nice thing. Um, you know the type of flexibility that we have now with. Uh, different wallets and things signing things um, in the main chain you know now is soon going to be coming to liquid and anything based on elements um, a lot of bug fixes and they have dynamic 
federation support. Um, the thing I was talking about um, when I was going over um, the uses and applications of Miniscript. So that is um, actually nice. So really soon, um, like that's going to be coming to Liquid and is in the Elements code base that the federation can actually dynamically add or remove or just change the membership set of the federation dynamically on their own um, through, you know, just um, enforced processes in the actual security modules they use. So that's going to be pretty fucking cool. Well, that was it. I said, I said it was going to be short. Shit, I didn't cover this first, guys. I'm not getting my Blockstream shield bonus again. Damn it. Damn it. Well, that's what you get. Everyone is making mistakes, don't worry. Yeah, it's still trying to get adjusted to this new format in the Mumble. It's, uh, it's got me a little throwed. Alrighty though, uh, so I guess it is time to shuttle along into the next entertaining bit of news. Yeah, so uh, how many of you loaded up Twitter on September 24th and were instantly bombarded with tweets about the supposedly drunk Telegram oopsie messages of the Kick CEO? <laughs> Me, I was laughing my face off. I saw I it know. and then I stopped caring, so I, I left the, the computer. Yeah, I so have no idea what you're talking about. Please explain the context. Oh, then you're going to enjoy this. So if you don't know what Kick is, um, I don't really know either, but you may have remembered us talking about Kick back in May for episode 178, uh, Culture Creek, when they were asking for donations in order to fight the SEC. And that's basically the extent of my knowledge about them because they're really not worth learning about. <laughs> um, anyway, Coindesk had originally published an article a few days ago, which claimed that the CEO, Ted Livingston, had accidentally sent them a message on Telegram saying various things about shutting down the company and I'm not going to jail for this and all of that funny stuff. So then they realized their mistake and uh, published a correction on the same article and basically erased the prior one and they wrote that, I'm getting an echo, who's that? <laughs> Yeah, sorry, that's me. So in the wake, uh, this is in their corrected article, in the wake of news, Kick had laid off the majority of its Israel-based development team. Our reporters sought to contact representatives of the company, finding a telegram handle operating under the username, I shit you not, Ted E. Bear, and bearing, pun not intended, I don't know but bearing the likeness of Livingston. So yeah, basically a Coindesk reporter was convinced that a Telegram account called Ted E. Bear in a picture was sufficient verification. But anyway, in response to questions about the incident at the company, the account provided what appeared to be official statements on the news that Kick is shutting down. At the time, our reporter contacted representatives, representatives of Kick to verify the statements given on Telegram. So this is already... Like, so this isn't just, uh, this isn't just Coindesk falling for a scam. This is them reaching out to a Telegram handle and then that Telegram account responded. So their original claim that there was just some weird drunk message that was accidentally sent to them is a complete lie. Uh, so that's great. Um, moving on. Um... Press messages to Livingston's kick email, as well as the company's formal press and contact emails, went unreturned. And it turns out that the reason that Livingston wasn't responding is because he was on a plane from Washington to Tel or from Tel Aviv to Washington. Uh, furthermore, after the story was published, the name on the Telegram account changed to R Mo, at which point the image on the account was replaced with uh, the Magic Internet Money Wizard, which is a Bitcoin meme. So yeah, this is just getting even better. Um, then the Coindesk Twitter account, uh, when they realized their mistake, obviously corrected their article and then tweeted saying, Coindesk has fallen victim to a Telegram hoax in which an unknown individual sought to spread misinformation by posing as Kick CEO Ted Livingston. We deeply regret the error and have updated the article. 
with uh, details of the incident. Additionally, uh, Editor-in-Chief Pete Rizzo tweeted, uh, Likely the first article we've ever fully retracted in my nearly seven years at Coindesk. We'll be evaluating deeply in days and weeks ahead. Our sincere apologies to Kick and Ted Livingston, and my thanks to team members who admitted fault and worked professionally to correct. Um, however, uh, that was apparently not enough because it was then announced just yesterday, actually, that Rizzo has left Coindesk as editor in chief. Um, the Block, which is, we all know is not trustworthy much either, uh, attributes this. Uh, to a management shakeup related to the fact that they are moving into their parent company offices of Digital Currency Group, which we talked about in the last episode uh, of 191, <laughs> titled Big Brother Sues Snowden and Coindesk Moves In with Sugar Daddy. Apparently too much sugar. Um, managing editor Mark Hochstein will supposedly be taking over for the time being, uh, but it would not surprise me if, uh, you know, whether or not he was planning to depart uh or not, um, I would be surprised if this fuck up did not have an impact on that decision to leave. Uh, so yeah, luckily for Coindesk though, uh, since they now block archiving sites, it will be much harder for us to remind them of their stupidity in the future. But yeah, this is pretty bad, and this is exactly why we we were laughing in the last episode about them having a reputation to defend. <laughs> yep, uh, <coughs> I guess we'll just have to <coughs> excuse me start doing screenshots more often now. But uh, yeah, as far as Dudas's um, speculation, there um, he's an idiot. Like that. That's that has nothing to do. I mean, in in terms of like you know him him, him getting shoved out, like no. yeah. So I mean, yeah, I'm just like, uh, I mean, they're trying to cover over this by saying we were scammed. Oh, cry, cry, cry for us. But it's like, no, you actually lied because in this correction, you say that you reached out to the Telegram account, not the other way around. So. This is not only lying, but it's a severe fuck up. So yeah, what reputation were you talking about being of any value, Coindesk? Mm -hmm. I mean, like I think I said last time, uh, you know, I can't think of a single writer there by name uh, who I consider credible, except Wolfie Zhao. Uh, he he does like a lot of um, like coverage going directly to sources of like stuff going on in Asia. But it's like, that's, that's the only writer there I can think of where it's like, I will like treat this credibly, even though it's at Coindesk and just because his name. Is on it. So no para, are you all updated now? <laughs> yeah, that was very useful. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, like I'll just do a quick. Yeah, I was looking at their defense. Their defend crypto fund has raised a little over one point five million. Well, one point six five four million, and uh, trying to defend themselves from the SEC. And I guess you know they'll use some of that money to push back against CoinDesk. All right. So let's go. Keep moving on. Let's talk about something else that's been happening on. Bitcoin Twitter, where people are getting excited. There's a growing trend in the Bitcoin space, similar to when we saw the rush of companies providing node services. We are now seeing a rush of businesses providing a Satsback feature. The Satsback rush is where companies are providing Satoshis for using their service. We first saw this with the app Lolly, allowing users to receive Satsback on their online purchases from over 750 merchants now. And while Lolly does offer big merchant support like Priceline, Walmart, Hotels.com, and other big retailers, it lacks support for some of the biggest online merchants. Well, now with this new Foddle app, you can earn sats back with Amazon, Uber, Starbucks, and more. This was announced just yesterday morning, and Bitcoin Twitter has been pretty excited about it. To be honest, the Satsback app Lolly escaped me because it was with merchants I don't normally use. However, this one has me pretty interested. I do use Amazon and Uber pretty regularly, and if I can earn some Sats by spending through this app and 
there's some good UX. It's most likely I'll end up using it and try to get some Satoshis back for uh, for using their service. But uh, yeah, right now it's still in just early access mode, early access, so you can follow the link to the tweet that's got a link to a website where you can add your email address and you can uh, gain access to that list and you can possibly participate in this program. But it's certainly exciting. I saw some people talking about how this was going to be bigger than backed. I mean, uh, you know, and it could be. I mean, this whole idea of rewards programs in Bitcoin and how exactly do you get Bitcoiners to part with their Bitcoin. And, you know, it seems like the sats back program is uh, enticing people to part with their coin. So, you know, somebody coming together with an app and these major merchants like Amazon, Uber, Starbucks and a lot more. I mean, this is uh, it could be a lot bigger. I mean, it could be a lot more for the uh, individual adoption and not the uh, the institutional adoption. What do you guys think? Well, I mean, I definitely don't think uh, <laughs> this is bigger than that <laughs> in terms of liquidity that this, uh, you know, could really bring in the long term. But I really do think that this type of like get Bitcoin back um, instead of cash back when you spend fiat is a very interesting, um, you know, kind of on ramp design long term for like retail people. I, I, I do think that this is real interesting because like part of, you know, the whole logic with investment, um, you know, a lot of people just don't want to get through the hump they don't want to set aside money to invest or budget like that and actually go through the hump like it's that's why things like you know cash back and points because people don't have to think about it it just happens and like when when you can have that you know a way for people to accumulate bitcoin where it's they can just click something and boom like it, it just happens in the background. I think that will be very interesting for how retail adoption goes. Because you know, I'm what the hell is it called? Lawnmower was an app a couple years ago that did something like this. It would just like take it would round off all the change from any purchases you made and buy Bitcoin with that. And it's like you know, I, I was always kind of disappointed that faded away because I, I really am interested to see like how that affects retail uptick. You know what I mean? Like when it's something that just happens in the background for people without them thinking as opposed to actually actively having to like take all of those steps. Yeah, I mean, because uh, it looks like, yeah, you just go in there and you can spend your fiat and you get some bitcoins back from using their service. I mean, yeah, if you can do all that under the hood and, you know, have people basically stacking sats without ever really – signing up to an exchange it's a pretty good deal i mean then all of a sudden we got options like olympus where people are getting on the lightning network real easily and i mean maybe we do have a world where uh, you know a lot of people have some sats sitting around somewhere yeah. interesting yeah, it's, it's, yeah. I'm, I'm i'm very interested to see where this kind of stuff goes in the long term because i mean like really like think about how like far you can take this i mean you know I'm, I'm assuming right now this just drops into an, a custodial account and you have to manually withdraw but you know at, at some point like these types of things could get refined enough where it's directly linking into um you know your cold storage and just automatically dropping it into that or when we start seeing like a lot of the solutions to make liquidity more efficient on lightning like immediately moving stuff into your control like that you know I mean, there's there's a lot of evolution i think that can happen from just like you get this in an account to you know like this is automatically being dropped into your total control as it happens yeah certainly going to be awesome i'm already signed up hopefully i can get early access and uh you know, actually get some sats back for doing some purchases. Cause you know, like I say, and the lolly does offer this, but it's like for Walmart and, you know, hotels.com and, you know, pets, Petco, like a couple of companies where it's like, I just don't normally go to those on a regular basis where Amazon and Uber I'm using at least once or twice a month. Like that's, that's something where it would legitimately, I mean, like I'm not having a really, 
go to a different retailer or merchant in order to actually start using it. It's something I legitimately use a couple of times a month at least. Mm -hmm. And, you know, why not at that point? It's, you know, it's like even even for me, like somebody all in Bitcoin, I mean, I most of my shit is going through like debit cards and stuff. And ultimately, you know, I'm buying in fiat, even though I'm holding till the last second. And like even getting a small percentage of that back, like just out of Bitcoin, I'm actually spending is like that's useful to me. Like I, I save a tiny bit of, of the Satoshi that I'm giving away that could be worth who knows what number. Heck yeah, buy some cannabis here in Colorado with it, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well yeah, speaking of cannabis and Bitcoin and all that, uh, Janine, you want to take us into this next story? Yeah, so if any of you have been following the case of Ross Ulbricht, you probably know that he recently managed to secure over 200,000 signatures for a petition that advocates for clemency on his double life plus 40 years without parole sentence. And so far he's spent over 2,000 days in prison and occasionally is able to send messages via his support network and family to post on Twitter, and yesterday um, there was actually an essay published that he wrote about Bitcoin uh, titled Bitcoin Equals Freedom, and besides the fact that this is a letter from Ross, which we don't get very often, I think it was also perfect timing because all anyone could talk about yesterday was how Bitcoin was going to die because it was worth one to two thousand dollars less than a month ago, which is just absurd to me on the grand scale of things. So I just want to read a portion of it because um, I think it's really good. And in the essay, he writes, Something special happened in the first year or so after Satoshi gave us Bitcoin, something no one expected and many thought impossible. Try to imagine Bitcoin back then, before you could buy things with it, before there was an exchange rate, before anyone really knew what, if anything, would happen with it. Bitcoin didn't start out as money. It became money, but it did so unlike any money that came before it. For all the things Bitcoin has made possible, for all the things that is changing our world, in our in our world, we don't fully appreciate or even understand what happened in those early days when it was just a plaything for geeks. Even uh, or every other money that predates Bitcoin in the long history of human civilization was valued for reasons other than its use as money. Cattle in Africa, postage stamps in prison, seashells and precious metals all have been used as money and fit this pattern. The only exception is fiat money, something declared to be money by an authority. But even national fiat currencies were once backed by something with prior value like gold. Bitcoin changed all that. Bitcoin had no prior value and no one was forced to use it, yet it somehow became a medium of exchange. People don't understand and care little for Bitcoin or people who, do, who don't understand and care little for Bitcoin can nevertheless accept it as payment because they know it can be used to pay for something else or be exchanged with conventional money. People often mention the pizzas that were bought for 10,000 Bitcoins and in, hides, in hindsight poke fun at the guy who ate what would become a multi-million dollar pizza or multi-million dollar lunch. <laughs> I'm more interested in the person who gave up two perfectly good pizzas for mere Bitcoins. What did he see in those bits and bytes, that digital signature on something people were calling a blockchain? Whatever motivated the pizza seller may have also called to the early miners who could not liquidate but happily hoarded. It may have inspired the ones who simply gave Bitcoins away by the thousands. Whatever it was, it was something new. So uh, if you want to read the whole essay, you can find it at the Twitter account uh, for Ross, which I think is managed by his mom or just someone from the support network, uh, Real Ross U. And uh, if you want to let him know that you appreciate his letter uh, or possibly sign the petition supporting his clemency or donate to his defense or donate to his commissary so that he can get basic goods in prison or send him a letter or a book to keep his mind occupied. You can find all of that at freeross.org. Do you know, I mean, like, it's good to see this letter, but I'm just like thinking about why you're saying this. Do you know how many more signatures is needed for that uh, clemency to be taken seriously? Because I signed it and there was only like a couple thousand left. That seemed like it was a few weeks ago, too. Um, I mean, I don't. I don't think there is like there's I don't think there's an official bar uh for how many signatures you need to have but Okay, boom. I think as a I think as a 
I don't know, a comparison. I believe Chelsea Manning's clemency petition was 200000 I can't quite remember. I'll check that right now. I'm looking at it. Well, the Chelsea one, I don't know. But the uh, I, the clemency for Ross Albert went up. It was 200000 I remember signing around 197000 Now it's at 300000 It's like, oof. Yeah, so we got to get another, uh, you know, um, 81,000 signatures or 80,300. Yeah, so um, it looks like when Chelsea Manning had a petition for clemency, um, it was 100,000. It needs at least 100,000 to be um, to get a response from the White House. So Ross has gotten more than double that. So the White House at least has to respond at this point. Right, I think they just keep moving it up to uh, try and make it more... I mean, uh, honestly, guys, it's just this... You're, uh, you're still on, uh, Jenny. Yeah, your mic. It is? Hello? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It but, shouldn't um, be. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just, like, guys, like, Trump is not even going to consider something like this until after the election. I mean, like, that's, it's just the reality. Like, there, there is no way he would consider pardoning or, or even reducing a sentence or anything for Ross until after the election. Because that, that's just political suicide. Yeah, because he's, a ch- he's, a, he's in reality, he's a chicken shit. <laughs> no, it's, it's just, it's, it's practically, like, most of his base would not agree with that decision, and that might cause them to vote against him. It's just, re- it's political reality. Like I said, chicken shit. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of libertarians that could stand up and take shit, that. It's, I if, mean, if the... you want to accomplish something, you can't accomplish that uh, if you uh... are removed from the place that you can accomplish it from. That, so that's many... how any kind of... of any any type of complicated social system like that works i mean so i don't i don't even think that trump is going even if he wanted to i don't think he want i don't think he actually wants to give ross Ulbricht clemency and i don't think there's any kind of political situation in which he would want to because he's not that kind uh, of person he did but let's let's um, that's kind of the hold, that's kind hold, of the excuse wait <laughs> he did uh, he's I, literally one of the only major pieces of legislation he's been consistently pushing since he was in office is specifically to get people in jail for nonviolent drug shit out of jail. That is one of the only issues he has consistently pushed forward on since he was elected. Yeah, but you're ignoring the fact that the position of the government, even though they never convicted him of this and they didn't actually provide any evidence for this, the government's position is that he's a violent offender. Like, he was convicted for a nonviolent offense, but the government's argument that they used to poison his reputation was that he's a violent person or is responsible for violence on others. So he's not falling into that category of people that's getting considered very easily. Like, I, I hope that he gets considered, but I really don't think that it's going to happen under this presidency. Trump would look through that situation in a heartbeat and realize that's bullshit. Like, that's that's one of his favorite things to do, Janine, is to call out when the government is being retarded. I don't I don't think so. But anyway, let's let's assume I mean, that's kind of the that's the classic excuse of pretty much every president ever that if they have any plans whatsoever to be reelected, they they it doesn't matter how close to the election you are they like you could literally ask them to do this at the beginning of their presidency and they'll say well i plan to be reelected for a second term so i don't want to do anything that really triggers i don't know my my voting base and like that's what happened with obama he made tons of promises about things he would do and the moment he got in office he turned his back on all of them so i have no expectation for trump to be any different but see that's that's the thing janine is that is the exact opposite of what trump did he promised a few big things and has consistently been trying to get them done since he got there it's literally the exact opposite <laughs> okay. of okay, okay, man. fucking Obama. That, you might that, not like, you might not like yeah, what this, he's doing, but right, that's yeah, what he's this, doing. 
this turned into like a whole Trump thing. Like, look, you know, here's the deal. He's got over 200,000 signatures for clemency. He's supposed to take it seriously at 100,000. I'm sure that people are yelling in his ear. You're right. It's an election year. He does have to weigh political options, but he is still a chicken shit. Now, Janine, do you want to take us into this next story? Yeah, one second. So, yeah, we're going from one crazy story about somebody in prison and injustice to another. So, what's going on with Assange? Yeah, so I gave a rather short update, I think, in the last episode or the one before that about Assange because I've been really busy over the past two months doing other things, but I have, I've still been paying attention pretty much every day. And I've been wanting to create a third installment of my reporting series on the case in the UK and the upcoming extradition hearings with the US. And so just a few hours ago, I actually published a new um, post that catches up on the major events that happened in August and September. And I plan to keep adding things to it going forward uh, until it's as absurdly long as the first two. So in summary, um, Assange has been kept in Belmarsh Prison in the UK ever since his arrest in um, April, April 11th. And the U.S. extradition hearings are not scheduled to begin until February, mid, like end of February 2020, with a case management hearing expected on the, uh, I think it's October 21st, um, more than enough time for further mistreatment and miscarriage of justice, of course. So on the, uh, I think it was September 13th, a surprise technical hearing was held by um, a district judge at the Westminster Mag Magistrates Court, um, and she informed Assange that while his sentence for the bail violations was actually supposed to end on September 22nd, I assume, I mean, it was originally 50 weeks, for, it was like 47 to 50 weeks, I assume it was shortened because of, you know, no, in, no bad incidents and good behavior. Um, but she said that because of your, um, your history of absconding in these proceedings, there was substantial ground for believing that if I release you, you will be abscond, you will abscond again. Um, and so she said that your remand status changes from a serving prisoner to a person facing extradition, which is effectively extending his imprisonment indefinitely because the extradition hearings could take years. And so according to Assange's father, who was at the courtroom, um, she not only failed to give the defense an opportunity to produce a bail application, but there was actually a lot of weirdness going on where she supposedly refused a bail application that didn't even exist, or she basically refused to consider her own, like, I don't know, something about that she, she filed her own bail application, which doesn't make any sense because she's not representing Assange and that, uh, I don't know, the UK court system is just fucked if you haven't noticed. But um, yeah, basically their claim of absconding doesn't make sense because that means the UK classifies exercising the legal right to seek asylum as absconding, even though according to their own Bail Act of 1976, they acknowledge that there may be reasonable cause for a failure to surrender to custody, which I would assume asylum is one of them. And so Craig Murray, who is a former British diplomat, described this decision as excessively cruel. And then finally, um, just recently, just last week on September 20th, there was a communication error with the Westminster court, uh, which led to Assange being prepared for a hearing that never actually happened. And because they basically had to shut down the prison in order to move him around, a really absurd procedure, uh, he basically ended up missing an entire hour of a scheduled medical appointment that he had that, had that day. Um, which he obviously needs because he's ha he has a whole bunch of health issues after being isolated and held in solitary confinement for so long, um, including at the Ecuadorian embassy before they broke international law to allow British police in. And so if you want to keep up to date going forward on what's going on, um, you can find that at a new post that I just made called uh, Your Heroes for Ghosts, which is inspired by a line from that famous Pink Floyd song that Roger Waters has been playing at various venues around the world in support of Sanj over the past several months, which is really sweet of him. 
That's pretty fucking awesome, actually. But yeah, this is... Yeah, this this whole situation is just insane. You know, it's it, it might sound fucked up, but like honestly, it boggles my mind at at this point that they they haven't just killed him and tried to fucking make up some bullshit excuse. You know what I mean? I mean, I assume that the reason they don't want to kill him is because that would make him a very obvious murder. Whereas if they just spend years and years punishing him, it's you know, basically punishing him through twisting their legal system into impossible knots that make no sense. Um, it's basically just confusing people and not clearly marking him as a martyr and doing this whole bullshit campaign now on social media where they're saying journalism is not a crime. Like the literally the foreign office, which was involved in the decision to not um, accept the freedom of information request of a journalist to release more documentation from the Crown Prosecution Service, like the, the Foreign Office was involved in that decision. And they're now doing this whole bullshit social media campaign pretending that they care about journalism and how journalists need to hold government accountable. And it's like, yeah, and guess what? The ones that hold your government accountable are in prison. So good luck with that. You know, like there's a whole there's a whole section of the UK government that they're they're so I don't know. I don't know how they justify it to themselves. They probably don't, but they're probably figured out by now that they've they've so subverted so many of the values that they claim to hold that now they just have to repeat them over and over again, even as they're breaking them in front of us. It's literally newspeak, like evolving. As you see, journalism isn't isn't a crime. But wait a minute, um, journalism isn't what you think it is, folks. Well, this is where it's like, I almost think they keep him alive because they know that if he goes and what, you know, that he stands for, it's like they, it's like at least those people that still consider themselves in this fake journalism fashion or something, they're like, well, you know, it's still alive because he's still alive. Where if it's like, if he dies, it's almost like everybody knows and there's no hiding anymore. The fact that journalism is 100% dead. I mean, right now. It's like, we'll say that because of the way that he's being treated, where it's like in their minds, they justify like, no, it's like it's still alive because he's still alive or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the propaganda machine at its finest. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's an early show today. I know that we've got some things to do after the show today. So it looks like we're, fi I mean, that's the last story. So was there anything else you guys uh, wanted to talk about before we get into final thoughts? Load thought, load thought, load thought, load thought, load thought. Load... <laughs> All right, Janine, if you could find that tweet, we'll definitely quote it. Um, my final thought is uh, just to let you guys know before the next episode, we will have a couple of special editions. Um, actually, maybe the second special edition will release. Uh, yeah, it should still release before the next main show. So we got a couple of special editions. I mentioned one with Jack Mallers coming up, and the other one will be a surprise. Definitely an interesting uh, discussion about new things coming up in Lightning. You'll just have to wait to hear it. Hopefully you'll make it in the mumble. If not, we'll see you at the YouTube premiere. Oh. Uh, uh, do you have one, no pro? Yes, it's going to be just a quick note that I hit a record today. I spent 8.6 eight hours and six minutes of productive time today. Yeah. Also, if you are wondering how I know that is, there is an application that I cannot recommend because it completely destroys your privacy. It's called Rescue Time and it logs every application, how long you are keeping that open and what tabs you are doing on your browser. But um, I guess I like to live dangerous. Uh, so. <laughs> buffer yeah. overflow, buffer overflow, it. buffer overflow. That uh, efficiency gain is hard to let up on, where you don't have to type it into an Excel spreadsheet. Keep track of it yourself. Just let it all go on automatic. And yeah, it's easy, isn't it? It's just like, man, it's so easy. 
way too easy. Alrighty. Janine? Well, my final thought is that I've recently... Uh, I've been reading The End of Trust, and there's a section where they're talking about the counter-surveillance strategies of truck drivers, and so I just want to put out there, if anyone knows truck drivers who had to do counter-surveillance stuff, I would like to interview you, because that sounds much more interesting than ice road truckers. I would like to do an episode of counter-surveillance truckers. That is interesting. All right, uh, yeah. I guess... I guess my final thought is uh, there were a couple people tweeting asking us to go into the, the repo market uh, situation going on with the Fed right now. And rather than do that, um, I'm just going to tell you all, go watch episode 185 of Bitcoin and Markets by Ansel Linder. And he goes into the whole situation in the, the second half of the episode. But uh, rather than just repeat things, I'm going to point you to somebody who's covered that uh, pretty well already. So on that note, guys, we will catch you for these special editions and the uh, next main episode later. Adios. Shout out, Bye. Later, everyone. <laughs> Was there, was there, that's a good chance to